You're listening to the ESO Network, your station for all things geek. Hello, please let me see your ticket stubs for the Double Edge Double Bill. This week, the A-Team catches the fugitive right on your TV. week, Adam Thomas and Thomas Mariani will come to the table to discuss the randomly selected yin and yang of a double feature. Then, both will have to pick number between 1 and 10 in order to seal their fate to the next episode. One will have two good movies, the other two bad ones. Let the chaos begin. I am Thomas Mariani, and I love it when a plan comes together. I am Adam Thomas, and I don't care. Oh, okay, I'll put down my victory cigar and shame. Yeah, it's probably for the best. Uh, but welcome, everybody, to the Double Edge Devil Bill, where every week... Adam and I uh, discuss a double feature based on our topic uh, that we decide, and so uh, we end up with a good and a bad movie to talk about, uh, and uh, we are doing that this week um, for films adapted from TV shows, which is a topic we've swirled around, especially as sort of like a in-case-we-don't-have-any-topic-ideas-break-glass kind of thing, and I know there was some initial hesitation every time we suggested it because uh, it's got a bad reputation to sort of base a movie on a TV show. But uh, as we've discussed many times off mic, Adam, um, there's a lot more than people give it credit for on the good side, while acknowledging there's plenty of bad ones. Oh, absolutely, man. I'm kind of blown away by it every time we've talked about it. Like, so I'll name like two or three. I'm like, yeah, those are pretty good. And then you'll rattle off ten. And I'm like, oh, fuck. Yeah, I completely forgot about those. Yeah, there's quite a bit more. I think for some reason it's as maligned. Not as maligned, but it's like, hated almost as much as like even movies based on video games and there is way more good in the films based off tv shows and than the former well i think a lot of it has to do with sort of the weird reputation tv at least used to have because like at the time when tv became ubiquitous in like the 50s and 60s um tv was always looked down upon as a format compared to film and over the course of like the last 50 or so years that's really changed and just reversed Honestly, at this point, uh, you get more people watching television or streaming, honestly, in most cases versus like film. And I think a lot of that just has to do with a lot of people who were behind the scenes making movies have said that there's plenty of examples of like film was in a desperate state during that time because like, oh shit, everyone's at home watching TV. People don't want to go out to the theaters. They want to stay and watch the boob tube. So it feels like it's kind of like a weird like, thing that was put on TV just as, like, this invention. One of many examples of people saying, like, oh, it's the downfall of society, television, and, you know, how we've evolved since then. Yeah, I mean, there's probably a lot of truth to that. I never even really considered that, but I think you might be onto something there. Now, if they start making movies based on uh, social media, oh, wait. I mean, that was a big thing when, like, The Social Network came out, like, oh, the Facebook movie, and that ended up being a great movie, so... Yeah, but then there was also, you know, the Emoji movie. So, you know, 50-50, baby. 50-50, <laughs> indeed. Uh, but, Adam, we're talking about two specific movies uh, that were based on television shows today. First, uh, we'll be talking about my good pick, which was The Fugitive. And then we'll be talking about uh, your bad pick, which was The A-Team. So let's go ahead and jump into that now with The Fugitive. I came home, there was a man in my house. <laughs> He had an artificial arm. Are you saying that I killed my wife? All right, ladies and gentlemen, listen up. We have a fugitive that's been on the run for 90 minutes. What I want out of each and every one of you is a hard target search of every gas station, residence, warehouse, farmhouse, hen house, outhouse, or dog house in this area. Your fugitive's name is Dr. Richard Kimball. Go get him. (laughs) 
So The Fugitive came out August 6, 1993 from director Andrew Davis with a script that is credited to David Twoey and Jeb Stewart, which is based on the TV series from Roy Higgins. Uh, this TV series, by the way, came out originally in 1963, lasted for about four or five seasons uh, to 1967, and uh, basically followed around a uh, Dr. Richard Kimball, who was framed for his wife's murder, which he kept claiming was because of the one-armed man. And it basically was kind of like an anthology show, from what I understand, of like Richard Kimball's going around under different names, trying to like sort of survive in one small town, gets to be like the hero in some specific situation, but has to leave by the end of the episode to keep going on his travels and escape uh, from the U.S. Marshal that's tracking him down. Um, and uh, are you familiar at all with the show? I mean, barely. I was aware of it before this movie even came out, but I mean, that's about it. Like, I I think my dad might have told me a, a little bit about it, but I've like never seen it or anything like that. No. Yeah, I did an interesting experiment where, along with watching the movies for today's show, I also decided to watch at least an episode of the shows, which I was not familiar with that much beyond like the Fugitive. I knew was like a big inspiration for something like the Incredible Hulk TV show which I watch plenty of times in syndication, especially like on sci-fi channel. Cause it has a similar vibe of like the old Bill Bixby show where it's just like, Oh, gotta be a hero in this one town and then hitchhike away. And with the fugitive, you can see like, it's obviously very early television uh, based on that pilot, but like, it's a solid compelling initial story with that. Um, and it's, um, I, I can see why it at least had the appeal, especially of like that ongoing journey of like, Oh, he's got to like try and find the one armed man, all this other stuff. And I think that's, what's so interesting watching the film, knowing sort of that anthology aspect to the the TV shows, that it kind of feels like they integrated that really well into how Richard Kimball, in this case played by Harrison Ford, kind of travels from place to place in the span of about two hours and 16 minutes, and it becomes a little bit of a hero but has to leave immediately. So it's almost like you get a couple episodes of the show in the middle of this one story. Yeah, there's great bits with it too, you know, with the shaving of the beard, the dyeing the hair black, the dressing up as a doctor in the one hospital and interacting with the guard even, you know, they, you've seen this guy. Yeah. Look, every time I look in the mirror, pal, except for the beard, like, you know, that type of stuff. It's really, really cool. I, I agree. It feels like almost a, um, maybe a nod or a wink to the source material. Right. It's a really good way of adapting. I think my particular favorite one is when he goes to that one hospital. Um, I believe it's in North Carolina where Julianne Moore is working very early Julianne Moore in this movie. Um, and he ends up like he dresses up as a janitor and he leads that one kid after he looks at the um, x-ray correctly to a different place than what Julianne Moore said because it's going to end up saving that kid. That's just one great example yeah. of like, oh, that takes about like five minutes, but it both works as like a way of adapting the source material and getting you even further on Richard Kimball's side. Mm -hmm. Yeah, very, very early Julianne Moore. You're right about that. There's a lot, to be fair, of those examples. There's so many people who are very early. How much did it blow your mind when fucking Jane Lynch showed up? Yep. <laughs> like, what the fuck? Like, I completely forgot about it. Well, obviously, I haven't seen this movie in years, but I was like, holy shit. Yeah, that was uh, quite surprising. But I remember when this movie came out, uh, it was a huge, huge deal. Mm -hmm. Uh, this movie, it was, it was like one of those, you know, back in the ni early 90s, you, they were blockbuster sort of movies and sort of blockbuster culture around movies where every these big movies were almost like events. And, uh, you know, like Jurassic Park or even the Batman movies. And th this is the same summer as Jurassic Park. This was right there along with it. And I mean, this obviously to the Academy really looked favorably on this one as well. But yeah, th this movie, it was like nuts this year. And I don't think I saw this at the show. Uh, I know I saw Jurassic Park at the show because I had to close my eyes with the goat scene. <laughs> if I didn't see this at the show, I saw it right on home video release man and uh this was one of the first movies when i was a kid because i would have been only a little over 10 when this came out that i it was something kind of different other than the things that i was used to seeing or, or sort of movies that i would watch you know this wasn't batman or ninja turtles or even jurassic park this was something completely different this was like the first real sort of thriller movie if you want to call it that that i can remember seeing it feels like it'd be a really good like first grown-up thriller kind of movie for a kid yeah that's 100 percent what it was for me so because of that this movie has always left just a really really good impression sort of the launching point of me um, seeking out other types of films 
Well, an interesting fact about this movie for me, um, this is a movie I didn't see until earlier this year in full. I'd seen plenty of, like, scenes because this was a cable staple, so I'd seen particularly, like, the sequence where Harrison Ford gets out of that bus several times. Yep. But I never just, like, sat down and watched it until 4th of July of this past year. It's just like, you know, it's, all, it's streaming, why not? I'll finally watch it. And uh, even as somebody who was especially exposed to so many pop culture things about this movie, particularly... The that train scene, uh, the everything with the damn scene, uh, just I don't care, like all that stuff that we referenced earlier, yeah. and of course, um, the outhouse steakhouse speech, yep. like doghouse, head right? House. Yeah, so it was yeah. one of those where, like, I was exposed to so much of that stuff, and I'm like, all right, well, I'll sit down, and maybe will the whole movie be spoiled for me. I was astonished that all that shit I'm talking about happens in like the first 40 minutes. I love that with a movie I've never seen before, but have just absorbed through pop culture osmosis. We're just like, oh shit, there's so much more in this movie. I can't wait. And yeah, even after that point, it still is a stellar example of how to make such a great blockbuster thriller of a movie. This is stellar. Even for someone who hasn't seen it until very recently, it still holds up incredibly well as a great, awesome action thriller. Oh, absolutely, dude. It's solid as fuck. I mean, just the acting, the way it's shot, the stakes of it all. You can really get behind Richard Kimmel and his plight, but you also really want to follow Tommy Lee Jones and the Marshalls. Like, predominantly for the most of the movie, you're not really even dealing with a villain until obviously you get to the ultimate conclusion of the one-armed man and things like that. But most of the movie is these two guys who just one's trying to save himself and prove his innocence, and the other one's just trying to do his job. And it's really sort of cool that way that there's no real big antagonists the whole time the antagonists are the stakes it's a great example of um the kind of thriller where you're watching and it's just like man these are people who are really good at their fucking jobs with like the u.s marshall side of things and even with uh harrison ford he still is like a very like caring respectful doctor type and they're just like it, it's a great competence porn movie between the two of them competence porn i like that i'm stealing it <laughs> putting that on your bookmarks looking it up later after we're done <laughs> You know, the thing is, I just remember, too, as a kid, like, this is one of the very, not first examples, but a major, major example of when I recognize, like, good acting or great acting compared to mediocre acting. Because uh, Tommy Lee Jones, he fucking earned that Oscar for this movie. He is so good and thrilling. And he's, you know, just a badass at his job, but he's still got, you know, little bits of levity with his crew and stuff. We were all good, you know, Joey Pants and all them. And it's just, I really, really just remember kind of being floored by it. And also seeing Han Solo and Indiana Jones doing something else. Um, Cause those are probably the only movies with Harrison Ford that I'd seen up until this point. Every time I watch this, I, I'm just glued to the screen whenever Tommy Jones is on it. Yeah. Um, but then again, you watched Harrison Ford and this and you're like, Oh, he pointed that's, that's Han Solo. That's the Indiana Jones. I know he pointed with force at somebody. So like, you know, shit's going to go down. Oh yeah, dude. Uh, you know, as we've told people before, you know, on certain nights we'll do movie nights and go through sort of a uh, series of movies and stuff. And uh, I mean, we were literally counting and laughing watching the Harrison Ford uh, Jack Ryan movies because that's all he does at the point. And we kept, <laughs> because from this movie too, we were even quoting it in that. That's how much, like you said, the sort of uh, pop culture influence of this movie is that you had just seen this movie. I hadn't seen it in years. And any time Harrison Ford pointed in any other movie, we're going, my wife. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> just the way he says, my wife. Is like it, it works so perfectly, um, and it's very much I would say, despite him being Indiana Jones and um, Han Solo before this, this feels like the start of like the middle-aged Harrison Ford action movie that he would do throughout the nineties. We talked about Air Force One, for example, a bit ago, and uh, like the Clear and Present Danger, um, and some of those the Jack Ryan movies would follow shortly after this. This really kicked off a whole new phase of his career that he just really wrote, and it, it makes sense because, like we mentioned, despite him being like on the run and being accused as criminal he is so hyper competent like down to after the great train crash sequence he goes over to the hospital and the way that he's even like sewing himself up and like treating himself I mainly mean, just like that's a really good doctor he's a dude who's gonna be capable enough to survive this whole thing oh yeah 100 percent. yeah you absolutely believe it um i mean the only really unbelievable thing in this movie is that fucking dummy <laughs> when he jumps off the dam 
what the fuck? They, they didn't want to just throw another dummy down there with some weight on it so it didn't spin like that. But no, yeah, I absolutely agree. That That's, uh, like you said, competence porn, which again, trademark Adam Thomas. You put it really well. Both these guys are experts in their respected fields. It helps them in this scenario uh, with having that experience um, to no end. I mean, not to no end, but in, in every way possible. I mean, if Harrison Ford didn't know how to be sort of a good doctor and super intelligent and everything, he would not nearly get as far. He would have died right there from the wound. I mean, uh, it's because of that stuff that he, he's able to just sort of get where he is. And plus being wealthy and having these sort of smarmy friends and stuff, he's able to blend into that society as well. Right. Which is, which is a great contrast to like uh, Tommy Lee Jones, who feels so much more working class. Like the moment you see him, just yes. like, this is a guy who didn't grow up in wealth at all, but it's like so competent as Jap at the same time that you kind of feel like there's almost like this interesting class disparity thing there between like scenes like where he's chasing after Harrison Ford or even the great scene where they track down the other guy who escaped and he's got the one hostage uh, from his crew and all this stuff. It feels like it's also him kind of like looking down at these poorer people and how I love the weird arc that he has over this movie where he goes from being this guy who was like so determined on his mission to questioning Ultimately, when he realizes, like, oh, wait, he is innocent. So it's less about, like, the law and more about actually getting justice by the end of it. Yeah, absolutely. And then sort of, the you know, the guy who plays his, like, buddy and, and the other, I think he's another doctor, too. Uh, Jerry Owen Crabe, I believe? Yeah, 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 that guy. I'm not even going to try. <laughs> um, but the, old Jerry, uh, he plays such a good smarmy weasel in this movie doesn't he like when he when the ultimate turn happens you're like oh fuck this guy <laughs> like you you cannot wait for him to sort of get his come up well, but at the same time i think it's because what also works is that early on he feels believably like oh no he's buddies with kimball and he's like not willing to like he convincingly lies to both richard kimball and the uh sam gerard character about like hey look i'm i'm gonna help out my buddy he's not you can't catch him he's completely innocent i'm telling you but then he turns on that dime the moment like he's found out just like oh you son of a bitch we trusted you you were our buddy i loved you <laughs> like a brother like a brother to me <laughs> <laughs> my wife has the high ground um no um you know ultimately you know obviously the one arm man, man is the killer and everything like that but uh, old Jerry there, he, he ultimately becomes the film's main sort of antagonist, but it's not until the last, what, 15 minutes of the movie? Right, and until and m before that, it's just more of this, like, cat and mouse game where you completely understand both the mouse and the cat. It, it's it's not yes. so much like a Tom and Jerry scenario, as much as, like, a really developed back and forth between these two people to where you understand where they're both coming from. I almost wish it was a Tom and Jerry sort of situation <laughs> with Tommy Lee Jones and Harrison Ford. Hit each other with big mallets and shit. Every time he hurts himself, it's like, ow, 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 ow. Yeah. Ow, 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 ow. But, uh... <laughs> no, I, it's just... And it's such a well-done cat and mouse movie. That's a very good way to put it. It is such a good chase film. Uh, not in the typical, like, sense, but a cat and mouse chase. And it's just so thrilling and so well done. And in a way... Like, obviously, you, you want Kimball to get away, but at the same time, you really want to see Tommy Lee Jones get him in a way, like, catch his guy. And it's just, it's so fucking cool. Like, that's one thing about this movie, too. Great that it's based on a TV show and everything, but if you didn't tell, like, if I wasn't aware of the television show, this would not feel like a movie based on a television show. Because, you know, you know as I'm sure you know, which we're kind of getting to get into with the next film. A lot of times movies based on a television show are so beholden to, you know, the nods and the winks and everything where it can almost stall a movie and almost stop it flat where they got to include, you know, a theme song or one of the original actors or part of dialogue where it just feels so out of place. And like, you're only doing this for the nod and the wink where this one does it really well. Like you even uh, mentioned earlier with sort of the, 
drifter aspect of where he's going from, you know, place to place, helping people. That's really the only nod and wink you get, but it's so well done in the story that it only adds to the character and the idea of the cat and mouse. It, it breaks it down to sort of like it's essentials with like one armed man and the chase element and the yes. train crash, which even like in the original series, the opening just shows like, Oh, it's Richard Kimball was framed for murdering his wife. But then, he got in a train crash and he escaped. And it shows like a couple like fucking models because it's 60s television just of like trains yeah, falling yeah, over. Yeah. As opposed to in this movie, like, okay, we're going to take that and we're going to amp it up so perfectly. Like that whole sequence is such a stellar example of suspense filmmaking where just like one thing like, oh, the guy's foaming at the mouth. And then you see that he has the, the shiv made of the toothbrush and the bus goes over. Then they have to save the one guy. Oh, wait, they can't save him because there's a fucking train coming. And the guy who had the fucking keys is like, so long, suckers. Played by Richard Riel, who's a great character actor I love seeing. He looks like a big baby if you yes. put a push broom mustache on him. I know. I love Richard Riel so much. <laughs> he's such a good weasel in this movie. And then later on when they're interviewing, he's just oh, like, I you know, know, I saved my partner. He went down the same for me. And it looks like everybody's dead. And Tommy Lee Jones comes up like, oh, well, look at these leg cuffs that don't have any legs in them. <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah 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 richard yeah richard really is so good in this movie uh that's another one too like we mentioned earlier with jay lynch and julia moore where you see him you're like oh that fucking guy's in this this movie's packed to the gills but like you mentioned somebody like uh, joe pantliano or the one i knew uh was L neil flynn who plays the one cop at the end who's also the janitor on scrubs which they mean to like a weird part of an episode that JD discovered that he was like, hey, you're in The Fugitive. No, I'm not. And he's like, it turns out I was that extra real episode of Scrubs, everybody. They were running out of I ideas after Super Boy. Clearly, you think. <laughs> uh, yeah, I don't. I've never watched that show once. But yeah, there there is a lot of that. There's a lot of faces in this movie that I recognize. Even, you know, it, it, it's populated with sort of character actors or uh you know actors who hadn't really gotten their break yet and that's part of the fun of the movie too definitely and also you, you get a real sense of like that everybody feels so common at their jobs in particular like the whole supporting cast around Tommy Lee Jones I agree my favorite scene probably involving them is when they listen back to the tape and they find that's on the elevated train it's like oh you know what an elevated train sounds like and then eventually just like I knew it was an elevated train of course you did you're not wrong at all boss <laughs> <laughs> Such a great moment. That's part of the charm of the Tommy Lee Jones uh, character in the performance period is that, you know, he is obviously the, the best sort of manhunter that there can be. And yet he, he's real business oriented and he's really serious and he, you know, takes charge. Like the whole speech where he's like, you know, I want you to search every doghouse, you know, hen house, whatever. It, 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 like you would get pumped up if you're there. You're like, fuck yeah, let's get this guy. And the fact that it's also added to show Richard Kimball escaping between every single house yes. that he mentions, which I is shout out so to cool. the weird thing I didn't know about this until researching this movie was it, it was nominated. Obviously, you mentioned that Tommy Lee Jones won his Oscar for this uh, for Best Supporting Actor. It was also nominated for Best Picture, Best Cinematography, Sound, Sound Editing, Score, and Editing in general, which I found out this movie had six editors mainly because like they had to rush to get to the like release date because of Harrison Ford's like availability so this movie was edited and mixed and finished and all that within 10 weeks before the day it opened in theaters which is astonishing because of just how hyper competent all those things are yeah that's crazy and to the point too where if I remember correctly and I think you even added in our little notes here uh, I remember hearing that they were writing dialogue and scenes on the day like changing things uh, on literally as they were making the film. So for it to come out, you know, the sort of th the turnaround to be that sort of quick and snappy in, and for it to be as competent as it is, is incredible. Yeah. Particularly with like Jane Lynch said as much as like her scene with Harrison Ford was basically entirely improvised because he didn't like how the script worked. And I mean, they cast like a pretty solid improviser to work off of Harrison Ford. So I guess it works. Uh, I think that's the thing is, yeah, the, you would never imagine because of how clockwork the whole movie feels that it was like so much was reinvented on the day. And even like the cinematographer didn't like Andrew Davis and they both like really clashed on the set the whole time. Um, but it just is, so a great example of like how sort of this conflict and this worry and some of this like the um it, necessity is the mother of invention kind of thing which is like despite all these hardships this movie ended up so fucking perfectly it shouldn't have at all this movie shouldn't be as good as it is uh with all those sort of issues and stuff but i'll be damned if this isn't one of the best movies of the of the early 90s as well as potentially the best film ever based on a television show 
yeah, there's there's not a huge amount of contenders for like something this particularly great. I mean, you can even see where like plenty of other movies tried to do this again after the Fugitive, including I just watched for the first time right before we recorded U.S. Marshals, which is a spinoff about Tommy Lee Jones' character, and it's a competent movie, and it looks like it was probably put together in less stressful situations for the most part um, than this movie, except obviously for having late '90s Robert Downey Jr. in it, who apparently was kind of difficult and didn't show up at certain points on the set. But that's a great example of how you can take the same character, the same performer, and, like, so many of the other elements from that other movie, and how it just does not always translate when you try and hit lightning in a bottle a second time. Yeah, I've seen you commercials. I, I think it's fine. Mm-hmm. You know, it looks pretty good. The performances are decent. The lightning in the bottle thing it really kind of rings true with The Fugitive, I think, to where all sort of... The- issues that they had ended up making it what it is and uh what makes it so good and so special and you know how it is you see it all the time too in other franchises and and other things too and you know they struggle to get the first one out and it comes out and then they're sort of just giving carte blanche and a huge budget and whatever to do the second one it's usually never as good yeah it kind of peaks early on when tommy lee jones character is introduced in a chicken suit undercover (laughs) Oh, God, yeah. Which, for the record, if you reprised your Academy Award-winning role, you should be introduced in a chicken suit. That should be a demand for any time someone tries to do that. Where was that with, like, Anthony Hopkins and Hannibal? Would have been perfect. Jesus Christ. (laughs) (laughs) Marlon Brandon, Godfather, too. Excuse me, he did that reprise his role for that film, sir. Uh, Excuse the fuck out of me, he's in it. No, he is not. No, He's not they... in it. That's that's a big part that couldn't get him to keep like, me in the flashback in that movie. He's in the flashback. No, right? no, he is not. Like, there's the whole scene where like it's a flashback, and so it's like, oh, hey, Don Corleone is here, and he's never shown on screen. Oh fuck! I haven't seen that movie in forever. Wow. Big Godfather fangirl. I'm not a Godfather fangirl. <laughs> You're not part of the great fan girl elite of Godfather fans. Right, I apologize. Uh, but you know what? We do have a whole other movie to talk about. So why don't we go ahead and do our final thoughts here on The Fugitive. Adam, your final thoughts on The Fugitive. Well, like I said, it's one of the best movies, uh, especially blockbuster-style movies of the early 90s. It might quite possibly... I'm just going to go ahead on record and say I think it is the best movie adapted from a television show. It's fun. It's thrilling. It's exciting. It's well-acted. It's infinitely quotable and it's you know you don't forget it it's just it's a special movie man Uh, and it's special to me for several reasons and i i just i think it's damn near perfect even as someone who finally just sat down and watched the whole thing this year it is such a stellar example like especially if you were like oh i don't know like he jumps off the dam all this other stuff i've seen like the parodies and stuff there are so many other scenes in this movie that are so stellar the saint patrick's day parade scene and how stellar that is like him kind of weaving in and out of the crowd and avoiding tommy lee jones um, or just, like, the the whole sequence, like I mentioned, at the hospital with Julianne Moore, so many of these sequences that, like, beyond, like, the infinite pop culture watchability stuff, it is just, like, such a stellarly constructed movie the whole way through. I think it also ends on such a perfect note. It's, like, this weird, like, perfect Casablanca ending of just, like, I thought you didn't care. I don't. But don't tell anybody. <laughs> I give you an ass peck. Such a perfect way of ending this movie. It, it is, I would agree, it's a pretty much perfect movie. And I I will also probably concede that it is the best film based on a TV show. But uh, before we get into our next feature, here's a promo for an ESO show you can queue up right after ours. How did watchdog groups with no experience in television take a controlling interest on Saturday morning television? When did Wonder Woman make her animated debut? Want to know why there were two competing Ghostbuster shows? How Atari changed the Saturday morning landscape? How did networks compete over similar genres at the same time? Find out all of this and more on the Best Saturdays of Our Lives podcast. A proud member of the ESO Network. And now let's get together with the A-Team. An elite commando unit was sent to prison for a crime they didn't commit. These men promptly escape. Today, they survive as soldiers for hire. This is beyond nuts, boss. It gets better. If you have a problem. You look like you got a real bad attitude. But you can hire. The A-Team. I'm sorry, I can't stop looking at your hair. 
This film is not yet rated. So the A-Team came out June 11th, 2010 from uh, director, co-writer Joe Carnahan. And this was based on the 80s TV show uh, created by uh, Frank Lupo and Stephen J. Cannell. Um, and this was a show that lasted from 1983 to 1987 and was probably most famous for being one of the launching points for Mr. T. This is right after he was in Rocky Three, and uh, this was sort of like a big vehicle for him. And it was a big reason why he sort of became like a pop culture fixture, like that one two punch of those two projects. Um, and Adam, uh, were you someone who watched the TV show at all? You know, here's the thing I don't know if I watched it, I'm sure I did. I was really young. Uh, you know, I'd have been like four when it went off the air, but I distinctly remember playing it with like my toys and my GI Joes. And I think we even had the 18 van toy. Uh, and I knew all the character names and everything. And I, it's probably th through osmosis through my brother, but yeah, I was a fan for sure. Yeah, this is a show I mostly know through sort of that pop culture osmosis as well. Like, all I really knew before doing this particular episode was Mr. T was in it, and uh, they, the theme song, and that opening, yeah. like, narration, too. Just, like, if you ever need help, if you can find them, contact the A-Team. Um, and, like, there was a lot of, like, sort of pop culture parodies of this particular, like, I remember there's a funny robot chicken sketch about this. Family Guy, of course, referenced it. There's several different examples of and even mr t as a pop culture figure i was aware of well before this sure. um i mean just look up the treat your mother right song which is one of my favorite things that exists yep it's excellent <laughs> uh, and he's always a jovial fun personality to see and this was a movie that was trying to sort of cash in on that i didn't see this when it came out it was apparently not a huge success it cost 110 million dollars for the budget and only made about 177 so it was sort of like a break even but we're not not going to really continue this kind of thing and this was a big budget attempt to sort of uh, cash in on that with uh, liam neeson bradley cooper charlotte copley and uh quentin rampage jackson playing our four heroes here with uh, hannibal face howling mad murdoch and uh b.a baracus respectively um, and, uh, Adam, this was your bad pick, um, and, uh, would you still say that it's a pretty bad one? You know, I don't think it's necessarily bad. I think it is just so just average and mediocre. It's kind of just a paint-by-numbers action movie, um, which is, I guess, okay, given the source material, but if you're going to spend $110 million and sort of assemble that cast and everything, to me you would try to do something a little more than what we get. Like we do get a lot of big CG spectacle, but I'd argue most of them are boring. Uh, it's just, it's just kind of a bleh movie. Like I've seen, seen it all except for the, obviously the tank thing, which is so ridiculous, but it's kind of over the top fun. But the rest of it is kind of like bleh. And Charlotte Copley just annoys the fuck out of me in this movie. I think he's just so annoying. So it's, you know, it's an action movie. For me, it was interesting because, one, I also watched an episode of the show prior to this. Um, I, I watched, interestingly enough, um, not the pilot, but I believe it's the third episode because they technically did, like, a pilot movie. But it's one in which um, the A-Team has to save a bunch of people from a Jim Jones-style cult leader played by John Saxon. Uh, which is, a, it's a pretty fun performance from John Saxon. But also, watching that episode, I get, like, okay, so this was a show where basically it was a pretty much, like, paint-by-numbers kind of thing of the A-team is called to help out people, and they, like, storm and brigade, basically, to try and, like, help people out, face off against some guest star villain, and there would be at least one major action sequence that was sort of, like, the thing to propel, that kind of made it such a big staple with, like, kids and adults at the same time. It's just like, oh, it felt like this was kind of like a fun, um, like, low, low, low rent e example of, like, a G.I. Joe <laughs> Because it's just like yeah. we're we're technically also uh, fugitives from the law, kind of like the fugitive. So like we're basically like a military covert people for hire on a cheap level. We're in a van. Yeah, basically cheap mercenaries. <laughs> right, and I think that's the trouble watching this movie is like it costing one hundred ten million dollars just feels so antithetical to that kind of charm. To where if this movie was like half the budget, I think it would be a lot more fun than what it is because i think the best stuff is kind of like when they're emulating the show not in terms of direct references but just like hey it's a group of these like weird disparate people that are all connected by being like part of the military 
and they're off to try and like kind of clear their names, which is something that doesn't even happen until like 30 minutes into this movie. Like they have two weird introductions where it's like initially how they came together and then like their one of their last missions before they're supposed to go off and then they get framed at that point. It's like if you squeeze those two things together and made this like a, I don't know, 95 minute movie, I think it'd be a lot more fun than what it is. I saw it at like it's about two hour length, the original cut, and you watched the extended cut, I believe. No, I actually, I, I went and watched the original cut. Oh. Because um, I wanted to sort of keep in pace with you. Right. Because um, it's streaming free on YouTube with ads, everybody. Yeah, I, I agree with you. It, it's a little too long. The thing is, if you're watching the AT movie, chances are you, for the most part, you know what the story is of the characters. So for them to take 30 to 35 minutes for them to ultimately get arrested, and then you got to go through the whole different prison break scenes and then you got to get to the to them uniting and then the, it just it takes too long to get to what you sort of want out of the movie yeah i think it's also just where like the story actually kind of starts so even at that point you're like okay i'm kind of exhausted by the weird structure that's the thing is like once we get to the escape stuff honestly that's where i started having a lot more consistent fun with the movie and even like like the escapes are like small but they're like kind of character based with like getting everybody out and i think these guys it's such a weird disparate like group of people to kind of like bring together i think um Liam Neeson's having fun, and Bradley Cooper is kind of, like, having as much fun as he can with the material. And then the weird thing with, like, Quentin Rampage Jackson and Charles Copley is, like, Charles apparently was, like, a huge fan of the TV show as a kid, would, like, sneak off to watch because his parents wouldn't let him. So it feels like he's giving way too much to it. And Quentin Rampage Jackson, because this is, like, his first big movie, it feels like he is just kind of shy, which is not what you need for, like, playing Mr. T, basically. No, not at all. You want to see... The, the sort of someone match that energy level of like the Mr. T you, he should be the most like sort of, you know, over the top one. It should be B.A. Brackus. Howie Man Murdoch, of course, you know, I get it. And Charlton Copley is really going for it. It's just, he's on such another level than anything else in the movie that it almost becomes annoying to me. Right. And it doesn't help also that like even Liam Neeson and Brad the Cooper are going over the top in their own way. So he has to, like, try and go over their top. So it just feels like a bit much. And this was also that weird period where, like, after District 9, Hollywood was struggling. Like, this guy's great in this movie. We need to put him in other things. And I think there are worse examples, like the Old Boy remake or, like, Maleficent are, like, really bad examples. As opposed to, like, here he doesn't feel as lost. But also there's just a bunch of weird things like his accent, which obviously he's South African. And he uses his South African accent explicitly at one point to kind of trick somebody in the press tent. But, like, his accent also changes various different ways, like, depending on the line in a scene. <laughs> yes. Sometimes he sounds like he's British. Sometimes he sounds like he's, you know, Southern. Sometimes it is just straight up his normal accent. Uh, that's one thing that I think we figured out from watching this. Charlotte Copley is not a man of many voices. No, definitely not. But he's never been, like, an actor who I think is, like, phoning it in necessarily. I think that's the trouble. Is like, no. he's constantly miscast in movies. Oh, 100%. See, the thing is, with Charlotte Copley, I, I, I completely agree, because I do like the guy, too. You know, I, I'd argue his two best roles have been District 9 and then Hardcore Henry. Yeah. But Arnett, he's kind of just been a, a dud in everything he's in. Even in the, the bad Neil Blomkamp movies, I would argue he's at least the most interesting performer. Like, I think he's the one person who seems to give a shit in Elysium. And then Chappie, he is trying so desperately to make that work. Yeah, he's yeah, he's really giving it his all. But they make him do... Maybe they don't make him do. Maybe it's up to him, but I highly doubt it. You know, that's what director, how directors work. They, he just... They give him so many weird directions and choices and, and, and things to sort of do and it just always comes across odd even in elysium like yeah I, I, he might be the only one giving a shit but his voice that the voice they give him to do like the real gruff version of his own natural voice you could barely understand a word he says in it the best use of him in this movie i would say is that they go to the mental ward facility he escapes and it's not so much like him calling everybody together for the 3D movie, but everything from when that fucking car bursts through the fucking wall to when they're leaving, it's just like, tell me how the movie ends, and then they're just, like, going off. That starts to think, like, the best part of this whole movie is, like, that sequence leading up to the tank thing, which I agree, I think is, it's very ridiculous, but in a way where it's like, you know, if you were going to do an A-team movie, this feels like this would be the big action scene you lead up to, but for a big cinematic thing. Like, this should have been the only sequence that went this over the top, 
as opposed to after this point there's a a weird thing where like a cargo bay like gets destroyed and it's just like why was this in this 18 movie is this big sense of cgi like destroying the fucking cargo bay it's just like i don't know if that was necessary <laughs> no yeah i completely agree uh, and then we need to just get sort of the weird patrick wilson character like i don't I, he, like adam my hot take is that patrick wilson is easily the best part of this movie <laughs> i love all the stuff with patrick wilson <laughs> No, he's he's good. He's really good in it. It's just such a weird character to me. Like I, I don't know, but yeah, no, I, I I honestly think yeah, he's the best in it. And then I would honestly, I really kind of like Brian Bloom. Yes, one of the co-writers of this movie also popped up. Like the best scene in the movie is like them arguing with each other about like the guns in the car <laughs> with the one guy's just like, oh my yeah. god, just shoot me now. This is so embarrassing for you guys. Mm -hmm. Yeah, Brian Bloom. I always knew him as a voice actor because that's what he's done a lot of, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of cartoons and video games. So when he showed up in this, I was like, wow, really? And he's really capable. He's teeny tiny compared to everyone else, but he's really, really good in it. I'd say him and Patrick Wilson are. are my favorites in the movie yeah and even all the stuff leading up to their that sort of confrontation that happens like them trying to get brian bloom the a-team and like that whole acting sequence i think is also very fun with like him chasing around b.a baracus and stuff like that i think is the most fun they have yeah. with the b.a baracus character even him like going down the side of the the building and stuff like that i think that's the frustrating thing is like there's a really fun mid-budget action movie that's kind of dumb but like really it, it leans on like these guys kind of being together and outsmarting these like villains and the CIA and all this other stuff. There's a really fun smaller movie in here, but it feels like it was blown up to be like a bigger action movie, which I guess I get if you're trying to be like, oh, hey, we're going to take a low budget show and turn it into a big summer blockbuster movie. But it feels like if you go blow it up too far, it starts losing the personality that's there and it becomes more of just like this big extravagant like blockbuster tentpole movie especially this was 2010 you see so much of like bad blockbuster like previous set pieces in this movie that have become worse and worse as time has gone on like what do you mean well i would say like the cargo shipping scene for example that feels like a scene that was like plotted out so long ago because previous if you don't know is basically where like after they have like a finished script they immediately put together like the big cg action set pieces yeah. in a previous way so that you can't, like, change much in production. So thus, like, when you get sequences like the cargo bay or some of the bigger, like, CG heavy moments in this movie, it feels so much like this movie's on rails as opposed to, like, a 18 movie should be, like, fun and chaotic in a way that this movie sometimes achieves, but other times it feels like, oh, we're kind of um, at the mercy of being this big, extravagant spectacle movie. Yeah, no, I definitely agree with you. I, I think the inflated budget is what hurts the movie. 100%. I think if this was scaled back just a little bit and, you know, a good half hour shorter, uh, I, I think you could have something really fun here. It's just what you've seen a thousand times now. It's a gratuitous explosion movie with stereotypical cookie cutter action movie shit in it. But at the same time, there is still fun stuff in there. Like, even before the cargo bay, like, in, destroys it on itself, I like the setup of that scene being like, oh, it's a game of shells. Like, that's a lot of fun, and that Bradley Cooper, like, explains that whole thing, and it's like they're diverging away and, like, tricking Patrick Wilson. That's fun, but then the moment, like, that everything starts, like, caving in and it goes over the top in terms of how big explosioning it is, it feels like, okay, we're, we're kind of like, you already spent that up earlier with the tank scene, which I think is the better example of that. Of just, like, you're still involved with the characters, and they're still, like, bouncing off each other while Bradley Cooper's got a machine gun on top of a tank. Like there's something that's more like enjoyable there as opposed to getting like to that sequence where it feels a lot more uneven. We mentioned this cast. This cast is so fascinating where you've got like Copley, who, as I mentioned, was kind of in this weird state. Everyone was trying to plug him into movies and Quentin Rampage Jackson, who was in this and I think a couple other movies, but that's about it. Um, and then weirdly, this is like Liam Neeson right before he fully goes off with like the post Taken career because Taken had come out like right before this. I was a surprise hit. And then from here on in, it's just like old man action movies pretty much from here on in. And then Bradley Cooper, this is right after The Hangover. So following this, he would become like the big like eventual like comedy guy and then drama star and eventually being like nominated for a bunch of Oscars and shit. Who would you say, sort of, like, of these guys is in this movie? Who is the MVP of those four? I think Liam Neeson is having the most, you know, literally cigar-chewing fun in the movie. You get the authority and sort of the uh, why these guys would follow him and the gruffness and 
sort of the miles that he's had on him in his career as the military guy and all that. I, I think Liam Neeson uh, not only is the best in the movie, but I'd say argue he's closest to the original character as well. Right, he's a lot more of that George Papard, like literally he's got the mm-hmm. cigar in his mouth the whole time pretty much, yeah. I would say Cooper is at least like a not-too-distant second. I think some of the best scenes are with the two of them, like particularly right after uh, Bradley Cooper escapes from prison, which is also a great sequence of him just like being pampered in prison, being like, oh, he's the guy who's like um, the like handsome one who's able to get what he wants no matter what, and then contrasted with like the Liam Neeson character who's like the hard, gruff military guy who's like still willing to have a bit of fun after like a mission comes together as he likes to say like i think they have the most fun off of each other like when they're escaping and all this other stuff and i think when the four of them actually get a chance to like kind of interact with each other like when neeson interacts with either copley or quinn rampage jackson same thing with cooper they bring out the best in those guys i just kind of wish like the four of them were in the movie like in scenes together playing off of each other more yeah i agree they do this weird thing where they split them up a lot a lot of it is Charlotte Copley and BA and then Bradley Cooper and um, Liam Neeson uh, you know the, th- the thing is that sort of hampers Bradley Cooper's character to me is the whole Jessica Biel thing I, I don't mind Jessica Biel in the movie I don't mind her you know sort of being this DOD up and comer who was after them but the, the fact that they had to tie it in that these two previously had a relationship, they still have feelings for each other and all this. I, I just feel like it's it's another tacked on thing that was unnecessary. Yeah, I would generally agree. I think also it's like the weird thing of having both her and then Patrick Wilson as well. I think it kind of like splits the difference between those two in a way that's unfortunate. Because I think, yeah, Beale is like a solid actress and I think she's doing what she can with this. But she's just being so outshone by like either you know, Neeson or Cooper, or like I said, my favorite of the whole cast being Patrick Wilson, where Patrick Wilson, I love how put together he is and how he just gradually completely falls apart (laughs) as the movie goes along. Like when he, like, here's the initial thing of like, oh my God, they actually got away with this. They're alive and they're bringing this guy who like incriminated them back. And he's like kicking his car in anger, just like, oh, the (laughs) 18. Like he is so flustered in a way that's so fun. It just reminds me, like, God damn, Patrick Wilson's such a, like, underrated actor with how he's especially, like, I want him to be more, like, fun villains like this in movies. Oh, yeah, I could, yeah, I 100% agree with you. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, and how did you feel about the big, like, sort of major dad swerve? It feels like it's a weird, like, you already kind of, like, did this earlier, where it's just, like, the, the whole, like, oh, he ended up dying. Like, that happens, like, at the 35-minute point when the story starts, like, oh, he's uh, dead. Yeah. And then it happens again where she's like, oh, he's dead and we can't clear our names <laughs> because he was there. Yeah. Just, it feels like a weird repetitive story thing. Just like this happened like an hour ago, guys. No, I completely agree. And the, the thing is, too, it wasn't even really well done in the first one because, oh, yeah, oh, he's dead. Come on. I knew when I first saw it. I was like, he's not dead. They don't show it. You, they just show a random Humvee driving up and it explodes. Like, it's not him. There's no way. And I was dead on it's pretty easily telegraphed that that's not the end of him and then once they start showing the pictures you know of him with the fake beard and and all that stuff it's like gee i wonder who that is <laughs> like it's so stupid yeah as the quote-unquote a rab as they call him which is also a bit of like bro militarisms in this movie that also kind of like driven back a yeah. bit that thing is more just like joe carnahan was kind of in that state particularly at this point and he's a guy who i'm kind of frustrated by because i think he has a lot of charms as a director i think outside of something like the gray i don't think he's quite been able to go full on with his sort of visions and like he's left plenty of like movies and stuff like that like he was supposed to be the guy who did bad boys 3 and then he left he's been like one of those guys just been like i'm in production for a while and then i leave i think he's a solid director that's just in search of like a project that doesn't feel like it's so studio hands involved kind of thing yeah, I, I completely agree, because, I mean, I fucking love Narc. I think Narc is a stellar, stellar movie, and I, I think The Grey uh, is actually pretty damn good, too. It's not at all what I thought it was going to be. Everybody thinks it's, you know, Liam Neeson versus Wolves, and it, it's not. It, it, I mean, it is, but not 100%. It's more of this meditative drama about masculinity and how you're facing off in, like, yeah. the, in in nature, how you come to your barest self. Um, It's a bit more nuance right. than just Liam Neeson punches wolves. I think that's fine. Trailer lied, but who cares? It's still a good movie. Yeah, shit, it was a good surprise. Yeah. But yeah, no, I agree with you. I, Cause he does have a, an eye. Like I, I do like Joel Carnahan, but 
yeah, I'd like to see him maybe get something a little bit more scaled back again and, and something he can have a little bit more control over. I, I think that would serve him well. Because you can see those fleeting things, like even during the opening sequence, like I love the actual shots of like the van coming in and like Brad the Cooper like going down with the tires and stuff like that. Like there's a mm-hmm. lot of fun beats to this to where I get why this has like sort of a cult following in its own way. And I can kind of see it. But I just feel it's a trouble. Like the movie constantly is like very uneven with how much like dumb fun it is versus just how dumb it is. Uh, yeah, I agree. I think that's a perfect way to put it. And I think those, you know, those are my final thoughts coming together. Uh, but Adam, do you have anything to add to that? You know, it's not the worst one based on a TV show. I mean, by any means, there is some fun here. It's a little too long in the fucking tooth, and it's a little bit cliche. So I mean, if you've never seen it and you're into action movies and sort of silly characters and stuff, you might like it. Ultimately, it's forgettable. Actually, before we transition out of the movie, two things. One, you kind of referenced this earlier with our last movie. Of like, There are definitely a bunch of like t- like nods and winks to the TV show in this, particularly like the cameos yeah. from Dwight Schultz and Dirk Benedict that happen yeah. that are a bit rough. Um, but there's that, but also, how about this alternative history where someone who auditioned to be the B.A. Barakas part was future academy award winner mahershala ali yeah that'd have been interesting that that would be uh, I, I gotta be i'm glad i didn't go that route i'm i'm glad i mean he would have been i'm sure he'd have been fine but nah i don't want to see Marshall ali do dumb shit <laughs> i want to see him destroy vampires not dumb shit yeah yeah <laughs> Well, on that note, um, we're going to go ahead and transition to our double reduce segment. But first, here is a message from the ESO crew that we fully endorse. Welcome to Dr. Geek's Laboratory. Dr. Geek here with another reminder that the ESO network is pro-science and pro-vaccine. We urge you to be a superhero and protect yourself, your family, and your fellow geeks around the world. Don't be fooled by the forces of evil and their anti-science misinformation campaign. Consult the latest CDC guidelines, your doctor, and get the COVID vaccine today. So now it is time for the double redo, uh, where basically, if you're new to the show, every week, along with covering the two movies, Adam and I also uh, go ahead and give you two recommendations and two not-so-much recommendations based around the topic. So Adam and I each have four movies, two good ones and two bad ones, that we would recommend and not recommend as much to you to uh, shout out here. So Adam, you're going first. What are your double redo choices? All right. So for my good ones, I have a film adaption or however you want to call it of probably mine and one of mine and yours favorite long time running uh, shows, the Simpsons movie. I think it's, it's really fun. I think there's a lot of solid jokes in it. It's not the greatest thing from the Simpsons. Like I'd argue there's a lot better episodes than even that film. Uh, but it's still a super solid movie and the animation's great in it. And uh, it's just, you know, the Simpsons get into hijinks that you love. And then my other good choice, um, I have the first Mission Impossible. Now, I love the Mission Impossible franchise, except for number two, uh, which is abysmal. I chose this one, A, because it's the first one. And B, it has sort of the most uh, connective tissue to the source material, especially with like the Jim Phelps character and things like that. And I still think it holds up really well. It's still a solid little espionage action film. This is probably the first and only one that had the most espionage sort of spy stuff in it before it just became crazy stunts, which I, I still love. But this one feels a little bit more smaller scale and, and uh, I still appreciate it for that. And then for my bad ones, I have fucking Wild Wild West. I mean, what a fucking debacle of a movie. I do not understand pretty much any of the choices that were made in this, uh, especially the Kenneth Branagh and the giant spider. And it's just what in the fuck are we doing here? It is terrible. Uh, it doesn't know what it wants to be. And it's just ugly to look at too. I, I think that it's a, terrible terrible film and then i have the weirdest sort of movie based on a tv show that i can think of because the universe of this film takes place where the original tv show exists but then they're making a movie based on it where uh, it's bewitched uh if you haven't seen bewitched with will ferrell and nicole kimmon don't first of all it's terrible but it's so bizarre. The plot of it, it it's just—it tries to be so meta and sharp and cool, but it's just a mess. 
and uh, it's a terrible film. One of Will Ferrell's worst, which is saying a lot because he's done some stinkers. Uh, just nobody knows what they're doing in this movie. They're everybody's on a different level, and it's just stupid, stupid. It tries so hard to be smart with its idea, but it comes across just bland and dumb. You know, just to start, like pick up where you're going with Bewitch. Bewitch, I agree, is very terrible, but it's terrible in one of those like really fascinating ways where it's it's like you mentioned. It is. It feels like a movie cobbled together from so many different drafts of like what a bewitched movie was supposed to be because <laughs> like on paper it's just like oh bewitched a guy is married to a woman who it turns out is a witch you could mean that just like a fine like comedy movie that would have happened in like the 90s or whatever and just done the show straight would have been probably serviceable and i would have forgotten about it but the way that they just really hamstring just like okay it's a movie that's being filmed and she's an actual witch and not an actress but she's auditioned and she can do the little twitch thing with the nose so then she ends up becoming the witch and then like like in this two hour movie the the middle like there's a middle 45 minutes or so of this movie that's a dream that's just like they end up reversing and then they just go back to other shit in the plot it's so it is like such a calamity of a movie um i agree with that um wild wild west i agree is pretty bad though if you're curious about like huh how did this happen um watch the kevin smith video where he talks about john peters and Uh that tells you everything you need to know about how weird that production was ultimately um and then with your two good ones um i remember being so hyped for the simpsons movie i just remember distinctly the simpsons movie it was right before i stopped giving shit about the show i was still such a super fan and then I watch the movie, and I like the movie, I agree, I think it's a, a fine example of, like, you know, if you were going to make a Simpsons movie, you could do far worse, but at the same time, it felt kind of like me saying goodbye to the show, basically, even though it ran for another fucking so many years after it. It feels like, okay, this could have been an end of the show, and I would have been absolutely fine with it. Mission Impossible, I agree, like, that one's gotten lost in the shuffle as the series has kind of evolved after it. Aside from, like, the ending with, like, the helicopter and the train, it's mostly, like, a suspense film next to De Palma obviously being the director there. And I think particularly the one bit that gets, that got parodied constantly of like him on the wire coming down is a stellar little sequence. But also my favorite is the one between um, Tom Cruise and Henry Senry, who also was in the 18. We didn't mention that was another great character actor at the restaurant and the tension that builds up there. And then the aquarium explodes is such a stellar suspense sequence. And I love that that character's coming back for the next one, baby. Yeah, he's coming back. <laughs> Fuck yeah. Oh, so great. So great. Um, but yeah, those are solid choices, I would say. Uh, but my choices uh, here uh, for my good, I went with two sort of comedy examples. Um, one is probably one of the first examples of a movie being based on a TV show. And then it came out in 1966, and uh, stars a familiar character you might be aware of, but in his initial adaptation that was quite comedic, I have Batman the Movie, starring Adam West and Burt Ward, based on the 60s TV show. Came out right after the first season ended, they made this, and um, it is such a fun, weird movie that I would fully recommend, especially when, like, this movie kind of got lost after, like, Batman 89 came out, and it's just like, oh, that's the dumb version of Batman. It's silly and over the top. That's not what we want, and that kind of attitude has gotten more and more toxic. <laughs> As time has gone on. But this movie is like, it's a stellar comedy movie. It knows exactly what it is. There are so many like fun comedic set pieces and performances from like Cesar Romero and Burgess Meredith as the villains. But even also just the whole sequence of Batman trying to get rid of the bomb, which leads into the bat shark repellent. Is like that got so much shit like from people like a generation later, but it's a funny bit. Just like some days you can't get rid of a bomb, and he's going around the nuns and the ducks, and he's trying to get it off. It's a really funny movie that I think deserves a lot more credit. And it was the big exposure I had to the show because uh, the show wasn't in syndication as much when I was a kid, and there's a lot of infamous stuff about it, it didn't get released on home video for a while. So this movie was my big exposure and one of my first examples with Batman. And it's a really funny, silly, enjoyable movie that still respects like a lot of things about the character, but at the same time, it's like a fun, goofy ride. I, I definitely would recommend if you kind of stayed away from it. It kind of feels like it's the predecessor to like a Lego Batman movie. If you enjoyed that, this is like the grandpappy version of it, which is still a lot of fun. But then I have a more recent example, a movie that I ignored at the time when it came out a couple years ago, and a lot of people did, and uh, I recently watched it earlier this week because I heard surprisingly good reviews for it, and I agree. Um, It's Dora and the Lost City of Gold, which is an adaptation of the Dora the Explorer animated show, which 
I was vaguely aware of as when I was younger because I had like younger siblings and cousins that watched that show. And it is such a funny, cute, light, enjoyable ride of a movie with especially the young girl, Isabella Mercer, uh, who plays Dora, who like in this case is like we show her like when she's like a teenager and she's trying to like get accustomed to high school in the city but she's still like the Dora character that she was when she was like six she is like a person who I'm like I want to see her become more of a star she is so enjoyable and cute and it's this great kids adventure movie where there's a lot of fun like adventures or like solving puzzle elements but also it's just like a wacky ride there's a weird like drug sequence that kind of happens in this movie <laughs> in the middle of it despite being obsessively aimed at like four to ten year olds uh, but if you're even if you're a parent um, I would definitely recommend you watch it with your kids and you'll get a lot out of it and a lot more at least than you would expect out of it I would say then my two bad are two that are kind of connected because they're based on shows that starred a certain actor um don adams i have first inspector gadget the 90s movie starring adam's favorite actor matthew broderick he loves him so much as we've discussed previously on the show um and it is like a colossal example of like how to do a bad sort of like family movie from this particular era in the late 90s he's so wooden and dull as inspector gadget not a lot of fun rupert everett is very bad as dr claw in a way that one kind of betrays the character, but also it's just like not at all good. And more importantly, D.L. Hughley plays a talking car. And it's one of those clear studio notes. It's just like, oh, guys, this is really, really dull. It's not funny. And it doesn't even have like a lot of fun with the conceit of Inspector Gadget, which was a show I watched as a kid. And it's like, oh, he's like a guy who's a robot man who can't control himself. That sounds like a lot of fun. And in this case, it's like really bad late 90s CG goop most of the time when they do that. And then the other one, based on an earlier uh, Don Adams performance, because he was the voice inspector Gadget, as well as the star of Get Smart, which they turned into a movie starring Steve Carell in 2008, and is probably, like, the typical example of, like, not the worst of one of these, kind of, like, based on a TV show comedies, but, like, one of the more forgettable examples. There's a really great, talented cast with, like, Carell, but also Anne Hathaway, Dwayne The Rock Johnson's in there. There's a lot of fun people in the movie, but it's a comedy that hits maybe, I don't know, a handful of times, and there are huge stretches <laughs> without laughs that are really dull. And, like, there are points where it's just either Steve Carell doing a bad Don Adams impression or just kind of doing his 40-year-old version shtick that he was doing around that time. Um, it, it's, a, it's a pretty forgettable, dull affair. Definitely agree with you about the Batman movie. I think it's just super fun. It's so silly and over the top. Like, if anybody takes that movie serious, then they, they got problems because it is not to be taken seriously. Um, and I'd also like to add, uh, if you are a fan of it or even the show, you know, the two animated versions they did set in that universe with the original voice cast. Yes. Um, as far as Adam West and Bert Ward it, it, are really fun too, uh, especially the Two Face one, which William Shatner is as Two Face. Um, I have not seen Dora. I have zero interest. I probably still won't watch it, unless like Lily, my daughter, wants to watch it one day. Then maybe I'll I'll, I'll watch it with her. Um, but hey, I'm glad you liked it. That's kind of surprising, to be honest, because um, it looked terrible to me. But yeah, uh, Inspector Gadget and both get smart are, are t terrible they're they're absolutely terrible um inspector gadget like you said and, and i think you hit it right on the head it is such a cgi muddy just piece of shit it's horrible to look at it's horribly acted it's just it's dumb none of the charm from the source material translates to the screen on that one and get smart is is pretty much the same way now i i never really watched the get smart show i know what it is but i also know what it isn't and it isn't that movie terrible film yeah especially when it's adapted from a source material that's like created by mel brooks um which i've seen some episodes of the tv show that tv show is very fun it's very repetitive in terms of like there's always these particular jokes that are in there but like it's still like a solid fun like sitcom of that particular era but um as we did previously we should uh, go ahead and just repeat are uh, what we chose here. Um, like I said before, my two goods were Batman the Movie and Dora and the Lost City of Gold. And my bads were Inspector Gadget and Get Smart. And I had for my goods uh, the Simpsons movie and the first Mission Impossible. And for my bads, I had Bewitched and Wild Wild West. Yeah, so uh, thank you all uh, for listening to us as we gabbed about those movies and uh, the double redo of it all. Um, we had some feedback, actually, that I wanted to shout out here from uh, Kanahita Mala, 
um, who said, listening to the recent double-edged double bill, in reference to our Willem Dafoe episode, and realizing I don't actually remember what happens in the Boondock Saints. My only memory is that I secretly wanted the brothers to kiss, which apparently was not the point we were meant to take away from that film. I mean, I get it. (laughs) I I get it. There is a lot of homoerotic uh, sort of imagery in that film, for sure. Yep, and uh, it's, I mean, it's Norman Reese and Sean Patrick Flannery, not unattractive men at that particular point in time. At the, I was going to say, at the time, yeah. Where, I don't know, Norman Reese has aged very well. <laughs> and that's all I'll say. <laughs> that's all we're going to talk uh, but, about. But, but, but then again, I mean, how could you focus on them when you have the ultimate snack in Willem Dafoe? I mean, come on. But uh, we want to thank you for that feedback and for listening. Also, we want to thank some other people, like Chris Oliver, for doing the intro and outro music used in our show. With some more of his music at chrisoliver.bandcamp.com. Thanks to Christian Thor Lally for our artwork. Uh, follow him at Night of Water. That's Night with a K underscore of underscore Water on Twitter, where you can find his link tree and find all of his great uh, artworks, as it were, where you can, uh, you know find his stuff and thanks also to our loyal patreon subscribers patreon.com slash gedvpod where every month you get to um vote in polls that choose topics we cover or individual movies we cover and also listen to bonus podcasts like right around this time you'll be able to listen to not one but two episodes of on the edge of relevance our patreon exclusive show where we talk about newer movies that came out uh, as we're talking the one for shang chi and the legend of the ten rings the latest marvel movie would have already come out and not too long uh, after we record this, we'll be uh, releasing the one for the new James Wan film, Malignant. And those are only for uh, Patreon subscribers who just pay $1 a month, and it really helps out. Yeah, I'm excited to talk about Malignant for sure. Oh, well, guys, if you haven't seen Malignant, that's a movie where we're going to have a very short spoiler section because that movie goes insane after a certain point, And we have to talk about it extensively. Uh, but uh, for more of us and our antics, you can find us on Twitter and Facebook as at DEDBpod. Um, and uh, you can uh, submit feedback to us, doubleedgedevilbill at gmail.com. Also, if you can't support us on the Patreon for just the $1 a month, that's fine. Uh, a way you could help us with just a one-time spending of money is to buy merchandise over at the ESOT Public Store. There'll be a link in the description for that. You can buy a cup or a t-shirt or a laptop bag with our lovely logo on it that helps us out because it uh you know we get a bit of a kickback from it so they should really assist us and do what adam buy our merch fool now we do not pity the fool that buys our merchandise ah you're pretty cool yeah not a fool not a fool for sure uh and uh for uh more of my own individual antics you can find me on twitter instagram and letterboxes at not the who's tommy uh, where I post some musings and stuff like that. I also do some writing at both marianithomas.wordpress.com and film-cred.com. And you can find me on Instagram or Twitter at atom or adam. That's A-T-O-M underscore or underscore A-D-A-M. Or you can find me on Letterbox at Schwanson. That's S-C-H-W-A-N-D-T-S-O-N. And uh, for more uh, of us here on our audio platform, please subscribe to us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, and other podcasting platforms. If you're listening on the ESO network, why not dig into not just all the other great shows that are on the network, but also uh, dig into the archives on our Podbean main feed, uh, where you can find a bunch of episodes even before we joined ESO. And if nothing else, if you can't, buy the merch if you can't subscribe to the patreon the way to help us that's uh, completely free absent of paying any money to us is to rate review or share the show around because that gets us more visibility and it's literally the easiest thing you fuckers can do yes if you can find them you can share us with the a-team <laughs> that's what the a-team needs to do this please share our show a-team wherever you are <laughs> that'd be awesome now, Adam, it's time to do our picking for next week. As we do at the end of every episode, Adam and I each have uh, two movies. Uh, one of us has two good, one of us has two bad. We switch up on the quality for that. And uh, we've assigned numbers between 1 and 10 for each of our choices. And uh, the other person picks the number between 1 and 10, and that gets us uh, whatever is closest to a good choice and then a bad choice. Uh, but keep in mind, uh, we do have this thing called the Godfather Rule, where from now until uh, our anniversary coming in May... Adam and I each have a single veto we can use on either a good or bad choice. It can only be used after hearing the first of the other person's choices. So I'll pick a number between 1 and 10, and then Adam will say his choice. And uh, then he will ask, 
do you want to take the cannoli? At which point I will either say, no, I don't. We'll go ahead and go with that choice. Or I do want to take the cannoli. That veto is gone. And we have to go with whatever Adam has as his second option. And it's the same for me as well. Um, and uh, yeah, that, that'll be uh, that's an interesting little spark in here for even our next episode, uh, which the topic, uh, which was voted on by our patrons, our edgelord patrons, as we call them. Um, we wanted to do an actress as a topic. And uh, we ended up getting, thanks to the patrons, Tilda Swinton, who is definitely one of the more fascinating working actresses out there. Oh, yeah, definitely, man. I, I absolutely love Tilda Swinton. I, I, you know, she's electric in pretty much everything she's in. Electric boogie woogie woogie? Yeah. Oh, I'm sure a reference that Tilda Swinton would love and isn't at all unaware of as a person. Uh, but, Adam, you have the two good Tilda Swinton movies. I have the two bad ones. So we'll start with your mm-hmm. choices. I'm going to go ahead and pick number six for Swinton. Okay, at number eight, I have the um, Netflix movie, Okja. I haven't seen it yet. I've heard good things. I remember it having a lot of fucking traction when it first came out. Uh, for some reason, I never really got around to it. So do you want to take the cannoli on that one? Um, well, I've seen Okja. I really love Okja. Um, I'm curious to talk about a Bong Joon-ho film on the show especially because it's a very interesting sprawling cast that just doesn't include her, but there's a lot of great people. So you know what? I'm not going to take the cannoli on that. I'm going to go ahead and I will talk Okja. All right. I'm excited. And then my other choice at number one was her Academy Award winning film, uh, Michael Clayton, which I have not seen either. I have not seen either. Okay. Yeah. Um, That would have been interesting, but yeah, but Okja still in good hands. Now, Adam, I'm going to tell you straight up that it was very hard (laughs) to pick bad choices because she has a very uh, solid rock steady uh, filmography. But between my two choices, please pick a number between one and 10. I will go with number two. So at number three, I have a movie that I know has a very big cult following. But I remember at the time it came out, it was not that well received. Um, I'm curious to see, cause I have not seen it myself. I'm curious to see what side I guess I land on. I have the technical DC comics adaptation, Constantine. Ooh, see, I like Constantine, uh, so I will not be taking the cannoli on that. Okay, all right. Well, at uh, the other end of things, over at number nine, I had another one uh, f- that was very divisive when it came out. I kind of like this movie myself, uh, but I get why it kind of has a divisive reputation. Um, another one with a big, sprawling cast, The Dead Don't Die. I haven't seen that one either. Uh, I kind of avoided it based on what i've heard from it so uh i'm good i'm good all right yeah but we're going with okja and constantine that'll be a very interesting episode uh but that's the end of the show guys and until next time just remember that i did not kill my wife i love it when a plan comes together like killing thomas's wife <gasps> i gotta jump off the damn now. no no did you see the bad dummy that fell down there adam <laughs> You are a bad dummy. <laughs> hey. This has been a broadcast of the ESO Network. Be part of the crew and help support our shows by donating to our ESO Patreon or by shopping for the Tee Public Store, which can all be found at www.esonetwork.com. The ESO Network, your station for all things geek.